Do you think there's alien civilizations out there? So there's a lot of folks who have kind of written and talked about this. There's, you know, the Drake equation, yeah. which is like, you know, the multiplying all the probabilities together. There's m perhaps more sophisticated takes like the uh, the dark forest, you know, which says that if the universe is like a dark forest, we're the dumb ones that aren't hiding our presence. Um, there's one calculation I saw, and I haven't reproduced it myself, but basically says that the uh, the assumption that other civilizations have seen ours is wrong because when you have like a spherical radius for like the you know, electromagnetic magnetic radiation that's leaving our planet, as that sphere gets larger and larger, it gets like smaller and smaller amounts of energy. So, you know, you get farther out, you're, you're not getting enough, um, you know, uh, you know, photons or, or what have you to, to actually uh, detect it. Um, I, you know, I don't know, I actually haven't looked into the math behind it, but I remember, remember seeing that argument. So actually, it is possible that it's so diffuse when you go past a certain you know, number of light years out that people, you know, that, that an alien civilization wouldn't be able to detect it, right? That's that's another argument. That's more basically about signals, signals from strength. them, from us, yeah. to be able to, signals colliding in, enough to uh, find the signal from the noise. Right, exactly. Intelligent right. signal. Yeah, Hansen, the noise. Hansen has an article called Grabby Aliens. Yeah. Um, have you seen his thing? Yes, on this, yes, right? yes, yes. And so there's- He's been on this podcast. Oh, great. He's brilliant. I like him. He, he pushes, you know, boundaries in interesting ways. In every ways, in all of the ways. In all yeah. the ways. That's right. Yeah. I, I I like him overall. He's he's you know he he he's an asset to humanity. Grabby he, aliens. So he he has he has this interesting idea that uh, the civilizations uh, quickly learn how to travel close to the speed of light. Right. So we're not going to see them until they're here. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, one of the things is, so here's, for example, a mystery that we haven't yet done, right? Which, or we haven't really figured out yet, which is um, abiogenesis in the lab, right? We've done lots of things where we, you've got, you can show macromolecules binding to each other. You can show, you know, evidence for the so-called RNA world. Abiogenesis is to go from, you know, like non-life to life, right, in the lab. You can show microevolution, obviously, with bacteria, you can do artificial selection on them. Lots of other aspects of, um, you know, fundamental, you know, biochemistry origins of life stuff have been established. There's a lot of plausibility arguments about the primitive environment and nitrogens and carbon snapping together to get, you know, the, you know, the RNA world is the, the, uh, the initial hypothesis. But to my knowledge, at least, we haven't actually seen abiogenesis demonstrated. Now, one argument is you need just like this massive world with, uh, you know, so many different reps before that actually happens. And um, one possibility is if we could do atomic level, you know, simulations of molecules bouncing against each other, it's possible that in some simulation we could find a path, a reproducible path to abiogenesis, and then just, you know, replicate that in the lab, right? Um, I, I don't know, okay? Uh, but that seems to me to be like a mystery that we still don't fully understand, like an example of the prime number maze, right? One of the most fascinating mysteries. One of the most important, yep. Yeah. Yeah, and and again, there may be some biochemist who's like, oh, Balji, you didn't know about X, Y, and Z that happened in the abiogenesis field. I, I freely confess I'm not like, at, you know, au courant on it. The last thing I remember looking at it is- What's uh, au courant mean? Like up to the moment. Oh, you know? nice, that's a nice word. That's a- that's Au courant. A, yeah, I'm probably mispronouncing it, but- yeah. Um, We'll edit it in post to sure, pronounce sure, it sure. correctly sure. with AI. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll copy your voice and it will pronounce it perfectly correctly. Yeah. In post. One thing that I do think was interesting is uh, Craig Venter a while back tried to make a minimum viable cell um, where he just tried to delete all of the genes that were that were not considered essential. And so it's like a new life form. And this was like almost 20 years ago and so on. And that thing was a, was was viable in the lab, right? And so it's possible that you could, you kind of reverse engineer. So you're coming at the problem from different directions. Like RNA molecules can do quite a lot. You've got some, you know, reasonable assumptions as to how that could come together. Uh, you've got like sort of stripped down minimum viable life forms. And, and so it's, there's, it's not there isn't stuff here. You can see microevolution. You can see at the sequence level, you know, if you do molecular phylogenetics, you can actually track back the bases. There's actually, so it's not like there's no evidence here. There's a lot of tools to work with. But this, in my view, is a fascinating area and actually also relevant to AI because another form of abiogenesis would be if we are able to give rise to a different branch of life form, the silicon-based as opposed to carbon-based, you know, to, to stretch a point, um, you give rise to something that actually does meet the definition of life for some definition of life, right? Well, what, what do you think that definition is for an artificial life form? Because you mentioned consciousness. Yeah. When will it give us pause that we created something 
that feels by some definition or by some spiritual, poetic, romantic, philosophical, mathematical definition that it is alive. Right. And we wouldn't want to kill it. So a couple of remarks on that. One is um, Francis Crick of, of Watson and Crick, uh, before he died, I think his last paper was published on something called the claustrum. Okay. And the thing is that you know, sometimes in biology or in any you know domain, people are sort of discouraged from going after the big the big questions, right? But he proposed the claustrum is actually the organ that is the seat of consciousness. It's like this sheath that like covers the brain. And uh, for mice, if you and, and again, I may be re recollecting this wrong, so but you can look. But my recollection is, um, in mice, if you disrupt this, the mouse is like very disoriented, right? It's like it, it's the kind of thing which you know. Watson and Crick were all about structure implies function, right? They found the structure of DNA, this amazing thing. And, you know, they remarked in this very under understated way at the end of the paper that, well, obviously this uh, gives a basis for how the genetic material might be replicated and error corrected because, you know, helix unwinds and you copy paste it, right? So he was a big structure function person. And that applies not just at the protein level, not just at the level of DNA, but potentially also at the level of organs. Like, the claustrum is kind of this system integrated level, right? It's like the the last layer in the neural network or something, you know. Um, and uh, and so that's that's the kind of thing that I think is worth studying. Um, so consciousness is another kind of big a biogenesis is a big question. The prime number maze consciousness is a big question, um, and uh, you know then definition of life, right? Uh, there's folks, gosh, there's I, I think. So this one is something I'd have to Google around, but there was a guy, I think at Santa Fe Institute or something who had some definition of life and like some thermodynamic definition. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right that it's gonna be a multi-feature definition. We might have a Turing test-like definition, frankly, which is just if enough humans agree it's alive, it's alive, right? And that might frankly be the operational definition because, uh, you know, viruses are like this boundary case, you know, are they are they alive or not? Most people don't think they're alive, but they're 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 on... They're kind of, they're more alive than a rock, 